When you're looking uh, to buy off-market land, you'll have done your own due diligence, you'll have made an assessment of what the costs are going to be, uh, you'll have checked it out in detail to make sure that there's no hidden surprises there and that you've got a viable proposition. Then you will have submitted it for planning permission, planning permission will have come through, and now you're thinking about actually building out the site. And at this point, you're going to have to do a detailed uh, costing. Now, you will have worked on assumptions up until now, fairly accurate assumptions, if you followed our process, for instance. But nevertheless, you're going to now really nail down the cost because you've got some real actuals that you can deal with. And the sort of the fundamental actual is you've got a set of plans where you can actually get some costings and know exactly what these materials are going to cost and the labor uh, to make sure this happens. Um, I talk about that process in uh, from page 51 onwards in my book, uh, You, a Property Developer. Um, I'm offering it to you for free. Uh, all I'm asking is that you pay for the price of postage and packaging. Um, incidentally, also, uh, along with that, I've created a land finding course, which you'll be invited to join uh, shortly after you uh, purchase uh, the book. Uh, when I say purchase the book, you're just paying for the post and packaging, not actually paying for the book. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Only about 15% of people who view this channel actually subscribe. That's kind of a pity. Uh, it'd be nice to see more people subscribing. So if you haven't already subscribed, I really would appreciate you uh, giving us a little hit on that uh, bell, on the notification bell but also on the subscribe button. So at this stage you're going to decide whether you're actually going to go ahead with the deal or not. Now you might be thinking why would I have done all this work if I don't go ahead with the deal? Well there could be things that have come out as part of the planning process that you weren't aware of before. Um, so for instance one of the things that's going to be done is that when you start the planning process and you start to go for construction drawings to satisfy building regulations, you're going to do some ground investigation work. And as a result of that, the foundations are going to be designed by a structural engineer. And you may end up with foundations that are considerably more expensive than you anticipated or you allowed for in your contingency. So that could push the cost up to the point where it just becomes no longer viable. Uh, the other area could be the planners themselves put in such onerous conditions that it makes the proposition not really a commercial viability any longer. So does that mean that you've kind of lost all opportunity, you've lost everything you've done? Well, there is, there is potentially a way that you can recover those costs and still make a profit. But you may at this point decide, actually, I'm not going to make my 33% plus of gross development value or even indeed 25%, which would not be a bad situation in a situation that didn't turn out particularly well. Uh, but then once you start getting below the 20%, then you're putting in even greater risk because even though you've had those foundations designed, until you actually dig into the ground, you don't know if there's some other problems that you may find. And, and I've found this before, I've dug in, we've had to go a bit deeper than we expected because has been soft ground in one particular area where we didn't dig, dig a trial pit and we've had to put an additional block um, on each house. Not massive impact, but 7,000 a house it ended up costing us more uh, to put those foundations in. Uh, but it could be much more severe that. It could, be, could have been a different type of foundation that we may have had to have put in there, which could have really spiraled the cost. So that's the, the reality is it may either for, because planners put uh, onerous conditions on or because you have have discovered something that you just weren't aware of that's now going to cost you an awful lot more. Now once you get sort of like I say below the 20% of GDV, do you really want to have that because that risk still exists until you uh, get up to uh, the ground floor level. And the second thing is you may struggle with a lender uh, lending you on, on that because now the GDV is not enough to support uh, their risk profile. So you may say okay I'm not going to do this development uh, providing you took it out on an option agreement and you're not obligated to buy that piece of land, you could walk away, which means that you just absorb the costs, which is why in the first 
first place that we say that you should be looking to achieve at least 33% of gross development value. So you, you, have, you, you can absorb those costs into the business because uh, you provided that money there. But the other thing that you can do is that you could actually, let's say it was going to take four houses, you could sub, uh, divide those plots into four plots and sell them uh, on the open market to self-builders. Now, self-builders, if it's an attractive plot, we're, we're, are looking for somewhere to build a house, um, they're not so constrained with the profitability. So even if they uh, achieved 15-20% uh, um, saving on buying a house that was a stock house, then they'd be quite happy with that. So they can absorb uh, a lesser profit. In fact, some of them will build without any profit. In fact, some will build with at a loss because they're getting a house that they want uh, with all the bells and whistles in it that they want. So they are, they, they are a potential market for you should you decide to, to walk away. The third thing that I'd like to talk about is the build costs and development costs. Um, and so when you actually start developing your plans, you're going to have all the costs that are associated with the physical structure itself. Those are your build costs. So they're everything from digging out the foundations to uh, completing the internal and ex external of the house. Development costs is pretty much everything else that's not a part of that. So there'll be your initial investigation fees, initial structural engineer, architects looking at it, your legal costs, purchasing the site, and anything that you needed to get started, putting in your planning application, any modifications to that, and then uh, preparing for things like uh, putting in health and safety requirements for when you actually start to build out the site. Also building warranty, which you're going to be required to have, uh, site insurance to protect you and anybody who works on the site, plus members of the public who may come onto the site. So you want to limit your liability. So there's lots of other costs that are associated with that, connecting all the services. So you've got your bill costs and you've got your, your development costs. And I break those very clearly into two different areas. And the reason that we break them down is because your development costs are going to be over the, the total site. So let's take the example of four houses. Your development costs are going to be over those four houses. So each house would absorb a proportion of that. But when you look at your houses, you want to be able to say, okay, this is how much it's going to cost for each house to be able to build it. And then I put on an additional amount to cover the development costs. And so therefore that then gives me a total cost basis uh, for each of those houses. So that's kind of why we split them into two different areas. Now, how do you assess these? Well, very often what you're able to do is one of the cheaper ways to do is to send your plans off. And it's better to send construction drawings rather than planning drawings because construction drawings tend to have a bit more detail. They also have the specification and send them off to an estimating service. You can pay anywhere between two and a thousand pounds for your estimating service. Um, so that's one way of doing it. The second way is that you can employ Quantity Severe who will go through all these drawings and produce a costing and a list of materials. Estimating service will also produce a list of materials as well. And so that, that gives you a cost basis there. And the third way would be to do it yourself, which probably in the early days is not something you're necessarily going to want to do, but once you've got more experience, you could do it. Or what you can do, which would be quite reliable, is that you can, once you, if you get a bill of quantities, you can then send that off to different suppliers, look at the, uh, the price of materials, so you can do that and then you can ask uh, the different trades to quote you for the different aspects of the job. It's far better, uh, to be honest, to get them to quote a fixed price for each of the jobs rather than an hourly rate, which could then fluctuate and you could end up paying an awful lot more because who's to say how long uh, something is going to take. And even if you were able to determine that and you had the experience to do that, how would you argue the case that uh, they say it took 20 hours to do it and you say oh, it should only take you 15 hours, but they actually spent 20 hours on site. So how would you actually argue that case? So a fixed price is far better. Generally, we would have uh, labor only rather than labor and materials because if they supply the materials, quite rightly so, they're going to add a margin onto that and you're going, that's obviously going to increase your costs. However, by sourcing your own materials, it does mean it's more work for you and that's kind of why 
um, you are almost uh, being paid that amount of money, uh, the difference uh, to be able to do that amount of work. It's not that the tradespeople are doing you in any way, I wouldn't say that. You need to look at it from both uh, points of view. And then the, the final thing I would like to talk about is the build route, which will have a significant impact on your costs. And this is something that you should have thought of much earlier rather than at this stage, but we'll just cover uh, the build route. So there's typically three different build routes that you can go. One is a, a main contractor, which is a turnkey system. You basically say, here's the plans, you build it, they give you a quote for the price and they hand you the keys at the end of the development. That's going to be the most expensive. Uh, one is because they're going to build in contingencies there because they're on a fixed price. And so therefore they're going to make sure that they're not the ones that are left with the bill or contingency. So for instance, if foundations uh, were going to cost you 30,000 to put in, they're probably going to estimate that at 60,000 in order to give themselves a, a fair buffer if things go wrong. Obviously, if things do go wrong and they have to spend the 60,000, then that's fine. But if they don't, they keep that additional 30,000. Whereas uh, if you were doing it a different route, then you would uh, you'd get the benefit of that. Uh, the benefit of having a turnkey is that you know exactly what your costs are going in and uh, what the price is going to be. The second way is to hire an experienced project manager. This is kind of you know, you get some good project managers and you get some project managers that don't do an awful lot and you end up having to do a lot of the project management yourself. So you really need to vet somebody if you are employing a project manager uh, to make sure that they are actually going to manage the project properly. And, and then the third way is to do the project management yourself. And you could have a slight hybrid of that. So you could actually have uh, where you do it yourself, but you have an, a project manager oversee bits of it so as that they're essentially training you in project management and the things that you need to be doing so as that you actually have somebody holding your hand as you go through it. So there is that is a kind of a fourth way to do it. Obviously, there's an expenditure there in addition to uh, your own time. But if you're project managing it yourself, one of the advantages of that is, yes, it's going to be probably tearing your hair out at times, but it, you are going to learn the process and really understand it uh, very much quicker because you're going to learn by actually doing it. So either of these three will have different cost implications and will affect your cost. That's why you fundamentally need to really understand at the beginning of the project what way you are going to go uh, so as you can build that into your initial costings and obviously uh, make sure that your land price is the right amount that you paid for that. So uh, if you would like to understand a bit more about this again I point to you to a couple of resources uh, there's my book which you can pick up a copy of at youapropertydeveloper.com and also you'll be invited to join my land finding course which uh, supplements the, the book if this is the first time that you've been looking at this channel there's plenty of videos around here have a look around we're, we're approaching 300 videos now and uh, please remember to subscribe uh, that really would help us with the algorithm until the next time take care and I look forward to speaking to them bye bye